We're so excited to be here and really, really grateful to the Office of Presents crew to, uh, to, for having presents. Um, I just want to say, uh, this is essentially the, um, the end of a year or the culmination of a year long process where these. Um, graduate students who are uh, pursuing their PhDs in various STEM fields uh, have given their time to this National Science Foundation uh, um, National Science Foundation funded program um, that is uh, dedicated to teaching narrative skills to scientists. So teaching um, teaching um, budding scientists how better to uh, essentially speak to civilians. <laughs> um, and so what they're going to be doing today is, uh, giving you 10 minute talks. Um, and we've asked them, uh, uh, to, we, we've, we've sort of tied 1 of their hands behind their back to, as part of the exercise where we basically asked them, um, to not use any slides or any visuals and just to essentially do what we do around the fire. Uh, and what we have done around the fire, um, since there were fires and people, uh, which is tell stories. And so they're going to tell you some stories about the work that they do. Um, and what I'd love to encourage all of you to do as you're listening is to remember that science is, uh, science is discourse, right? And so if there are questions that you might have while you're listening, please write them down. Um, because one of the reasons that we're doing these talks, uh, and one of the reasons these these uh, these scientists are doing these talks is because they love to nerd out about what they do. Okay, so we want you um, to ask us questions, and so that that'll give us opportunity opportunities to be more nerdy. Okay, um, so please do that. There'll be, uh, yeah, and there'll be uh, Q and A after each one, and then hopefully maybe at the end of our session, after after our three talks, we'll have a little bit of time to talk with people who presented today and also anyone from yesterday's group uh, to sort of talk about um, life as uh, a graduate student of science. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to our first speaker, who is Hannah Duff. Uh, Hannah is a PhD student in the Land Resources and Environmental Sciences Department. Take it away, Hannah. Thanks, Ken. So we used to think the earth was flat, like a piece of paper. And then we found out it was round, but we only knew about half of it. The old world, we called it. And then when Europeans thought they discovered the new world, they saw it as a second earth and they mapped it side by side with the old world. That flat earth had edges for humans to fear falling off of. The old world had limits for us to run up against and the new world had extra for us to exploit and to explore. The way we view the world changes our behavior. It shapes how humans see our own limitations and our possibilities. We know that an incomplete view of the world is detrimental to humans, and we have learned from history that a scientific discovery can expand our view and improve our understanding. So the same concept applies to how we see food growing landscapes. When you picture a crop field, you might just imagine a boring wheat field stretching off into the horizon. Some people would say this is a simple landscape just meant for food production, but like the old world, that's only a picture. So today in 2021, in the face of declining biodiversity and a growing human population to feed, we need to envision something new for agriculture. I study islands of wild, uncropped land in the middle of wheat fields, and these small patches of unfarmed land can be viewed as disappearing places in need of conserving. Like the new world on the map, they offer us an opportunity to stand our view alone and to change our behavior. A new map where we incorporate wild spaces into agriculture is like adding that new world to the old world map to see the whole globe. So this is why I study agroecology. This is a view that incorporates agriculture and environmental conservation in the same place. It values both food production and biological wealth. And the world we live in needs both. So if agriculture and conservation are not really two separate worlds, what is stopping us from seeing the whole picture? Well, this question leads us to our current dilemma. Here's the situation. Stakes are high and time is limited. 
We're behind the wheel of a car and we need to get to our destination as quickly as possible. So we start driving, but the more we speed, the more likely we are to crash. And this is the safety productivity trade-off. It's happening to our global food supply. The time crunch is that we're speeding because our population is growing rapidly. By 2050, we predict we'll need to produce 60 to 110% more food just to feed our families. So the faster we drive, the more reckless we become, and we're dumping on more fertilizers, we're spraying more pesticides, and we're clearing more and more land. These desperate attempts will produce more food, but at what cost? At the same time, we know that biodiversity is declining. Entire ecosystems are disappearing, and so are the species that live in them. Agriculture is partially responsible for this. Some people refer to food producing areas as ecological sacrifice zones because everything in our path has essentially become roadkill. But I think it's important to remember here that agriculture is not a simple villain in this story. It's part of the problem, but it can be part of the solution. So we can consider a safety productivity trade-off, perhaps increase conservation efforts and produce food differently, less rapidly. Some scientific studies show we can actually design new food production systems that maintain crop yields but also make space for wild plants and pollinators. If we keep speeding forward, just focused on production, it's like driving recklessly with half of a roadmap. We're likely to crash and fail. So our best option is to slow down and see the full picture and manage our agricultural landscapes for both production and conservation. So how do we do this? How do we change the way we do agriculture? Well, the good news is that incorporating conservation practices into agriculture is becoming more and more common. We know it is possible for agriculture and conservation to cooperate rather than just compete for space. So imagine with me, you're a farmer and you're looking for some hardworking farmhands. And this summer, you get some non-human applicants. You would have never considered them for this job before, but they actually live on your farm already. If a beetle had a resume, it would say lifetime of experience decomposing soil organic matter. The butterflies would read certified expert in pollination. The wildflower, excellent recruiter of beneficial insects to farm work. The earthworm, proficient in soil fertilization. And the mouse is a weed seed removal specialist. So of course these applicants can't keep a farm running on their own. You'll need some human help too, but you realize this variety of plants, insect, and animal life, biodiversity, is actually working on your farm as essential workers who are keeping everything together, doing odd jobs, going unnoticed. And the only thing biodiversity is asking for is just have habitat on your farm in exchange for their essential work. So in my research, we study agricultural fields in Montana that have uncropped patches in them. These patches of wild plants serve as a refuge for wild insects and animals, which is why we call them ecological refugia. So we go out to these farms and we use a lot of nerdy sampling equipment. We, we count the plants, we identify them, we catch insects with these giant sweep nets and we pin them in boxes, and then we've even caught a few small mammals. And the point of this is we wanna know where are the essential workers in the field? What type of biodiversity is on the farm? And how does that affect something like yield? So we found native plants to be concentrated in these refugia, which is a great thing for farmers because native plants provide great habitat for essential workers, like a butterfly that can pollinate their crops. On the flip side, we found that undesirable weedy plants are in the refugia, meaning that contrary to a farmer's fear, these refugia are not the sources of weeds on their farm. As for insects, we found that fields with refugia were more likely to host desirable insects, like the beetles and the um, pollinators, whereas fields without refugia had more insect pests, like aphids or grasshoppers that can damage crops. So you as the farmer, you can see having refugia on your farm might allow you to host more biodiversity in your fields and allow you to benefit from some of the services that these essential workers provide. But of course, you always have to consider a potential downside to this. It is possible if there are too many essential workers on your farm, they could get so hungry they eat all your crops. 
or they might bring in some other harmful family members that introduce new pests and disease to your farm. So this is where agroecology comes in. We attempt to apply concepts from ecology, the rules and patterns that connect all living things. We apply this to manage agricultural landscapes. Once we understand what service biodiversity provides, we can try to maximize the beneficial ones and minimize the harmful ones on our farms. So, as I mentioned, the good news in all of this is that conservation and agriculture is becoming more spread. Global movements like conservation agriculture and regenerative agriculture are making farming itself more sustainable. As for habitat conservation, many European farms have included wild areas like hedgerows and buffer zones into their cropping systems for a long time. And in recent US policy, the 2018 Farm Bill actually pays farmers to include habitat in their fields. And the USDA offers other cost sharing programs that encourage farmers to um, plant pollinator friendly plants. Um, to crops and even to put whole fields into restoration using the conservation reserve program. This means it can be profitable for farmers to conserve and not just to produce. The farmers, they often compare their management decisions to betting. They're making the best decision they can with a limited amount of information. This includes crop prices to weather to pest life cycles. And expecting farmers to make decisions without any ecological information is like having them bet with half of the deck of cards. So bringing ecology into farm management can make farmers better gamblers by expanding the agricultural view to the ecosystem view. So the further explorations in my research will use pre precision agriculture technology, which is just using on-farm data collection to grow food more efficiently. We do this by mounting GPS and yield monitors on top of combines and taking data points all across a farmer's field. We're using this technology to create the field of precision conservation. Basically, we can use spatial analysis to find the lowest producing parts of a farmer's field. We take it out of production, and then we can save a farmer time and money on these unprofitable areas while increasing habitat and biodiversity in their fields. I think this could expand our view of agriculture culture and improve how we manage our wild species and our farms. So by viewing biodiversity as essential workers and crop fields as potential habitat, hopefully we can shift our view to see that agriculture and conservation are not two separate worlds, but two sides of one world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hannah. That was great. Um, so, uh, I put in chat um, that I'd appreciate everyone. One thing you can do is change your layout to focus when the speakers are speaking. That way you get to see them speaking as opposed to um, a wide grid of names and one tiny person speaking in one part of, part of it. Um, does anyone have any questions or uh, comments for Hannah? Either uh, you, can, you can type them into the chat or just unmute yourself and have at it. I do have a question actually. Uh, do you, have you been like, is, is contour farming and are, are, have you, have you looked at this method in various other types of conservation farming? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I really like contour farming, but I was introduced to all of this. I was in the Peace Corps where we did agroforestry. So, we did some terrace Ooh, some different yeah, conservation methods. So I'm interested in trying to kind of change um, the way we do farming to be like context specific to each place. And in Montana, I, I haven't seen contour farming, but I'd be interested to hear what you know about it. Uh, I have a question actually. Um, is there, do, Hannah, do you have one um, beastie that has a functionality that you really, that, that's like a favorite of yours uh, in terms of the, the essential workers that you've been talking about? Like something that you think does something that's pretty freaking cool? Yeah, 
Um, one that I re I really love these beetles called dung beetles. If anyone's ever seen them, if you haven't, you should Google them. They go the field, and um, a cool thing about them is they're like a great indicator of ecosystem health. So if you're with a farmer and you see those, like people get super excited that they're there. So I love seeing them. Awesome, thanks. Any other questions for Hannah? We actually have a question in the chat from Craig Ogilvie. Oh, sorry. Uh, if someone else wants to go ahead, I'll read this after. I'm curious now, what exactly does the dung beetle basically tell about the farm? Yeah, that's a good question. I know a lot of it is about soil quality. So, like, if your soil is so bad, it doesn't have enough organic matter, then, like, those beetles won't even be able to survive there. So, I think they just kind of indicate it's a healthy enough place that they can survive there. That makes sense. Cool. And so, uh, Dean Ogilvy had this question. Uh, do you find that once one farmer adopts these strategies? Um, yeah, that's a cool um, thing, too, about the farming community, at least that we work with, is that it is really like a network of people. And so it's, it's tough to say because I think when we work with precision agriculture farmers in particular, most of their neighbors aren't doing the same thing. So they're kind of spread out across the state and they're kind of what we call like innovative farmers because they're the early adopters who are willing to experiment and take a risk, even though no one else around them is doing it. But the hope is like you said, the more they talk to their neighbors and like see if it's working, then it, it kind of spreads through a community. So we'll see. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, our next speaker is John Russell, uh, who is a PhD student in the chemistry department and the land in the lab of Sharon Neufeld. John, take it away. Thank you, Kent, for the introduction. A drop of sun falls from the sky and sprouts into a magical flower. Upon hearing about this magical flower and when the need arose, a king sent people to search high and low for this flower. Many of you may be familiar with a story of this nature. This is, in fact, very similar to the opening of Tangle, wherein the king sends out people to search for the magical sundrop flower to save the wife, the life of his queen. While most natural products were not quite so magical, the process of searching for plants with rumored or actual miraculous properties is an important part of history. As Kent mentioned, my name is John Russell. I am a PhD student in the chemistry department, and my research is focused on the study of suzuki myar cross coupling reaction. Through the advancement of chemistry, large-scale hunts for a plant or an animal are mostly a thing of the past, thankfully. And one of the many chemical advancements that has led to this shift in process is the class of cross-coupling reaction, of which the suzuki myar cross-coupling is one. What is cross-coupling reaction? Well, generally, all types of cross-coupling reactions result in the formation of a new bond. So, or a new, an often this bond is between two carbon atoms. So you'll end up with a carbon-carbon bond where the two, bond, the two atoms are bonded together. This new bond formation is achieved through the uh, action of three main components, the electrophile, the nucleophile, and the catalyst. These three components and cross-coupling in general can be compared to building a Lego structure. How does Lego, a very touchable, feelable, playable object, correlate to a chemistry reaction where you can't touch it, can't feel it unless you're being unsafe, and can't really observe what's going on? 
Or picture a pile of Legos freshly dumped onto a floor or a table, and then scoop one, some of these blocks up. You'll notice that on one side of the block, there are a series of bumps. And on the other side, there is a place to put these bumps, and that will bond the blocks together. The bumps can be likened to the nucleophile, while the slots can be compared to the electrophile. But of course, if you were to just hold these or leave the blocks on a table, you won't get anything created. The force needed to connect one block to the next would be the catalyst. When you put two blocks together, they form a new bond between the two blocks, and this bond or this joint is, can be likened to the bond between two carbon atoms. So when combining the two blocks together, taking the couple of blocks you picked up, sticking them together, you are acting as a catalyst in this case. The block you are putting into the bottom of the other block is the nucleophile, and the block on top would be the electrophile. Through this process, you have created a new Lego-Lego bond. And while this is on a different scale with slightly different components, it's the same thing that happens in cross-coupling reactions to create things we interact with daily. Similar to how many different structures and creations can be made through Lego blocks, such as cities, buildings, vehicles, whatever, many different drugs and chemicals can be made through the action of cross-coupling chemistry. So that should hopefully help, hopefully help a little about what cross-coupling is, but it's important because it's around us every day, and we need a little bit of historical context, though. Historically, many important and useful compounds were, and some still are, obtained from natural sources, such as plants or animals. Some of the classes of these compounds are painkillers, anti-cancer drugs, antibiotics, and, of course, vaccines. While this has worked in the past, it's not efficient or sustainable or sustainable to continue obtaining useful compounds from natural sources. Part of the reasoning for this is that to obtain these products, you would have to either grow the crop where you would obtain the product from, or you'd have to raise the animals where you would obtain, where you would then extract the useful compound out of. Also, it's not really efficient because when you're obtaining a natural product from a plant, there are a bunch of other compounds that are present with the one you are targeting, with the biologically active molecule. Some examples of molecules that can be obtained from natural products would be morphine from opium poppies, and you have to purify morphine out of the, out of the many opiates that are present. Aspirin from willow trees, Paxil, an anti-cancer drug from yew trees, and CBD from marijuana. And of course, there are some others. And while you can, it is possible to get these compounds, these biologically active compounds from the natural product, it takes extra time, extra solvent, extra, extra resources to get, to get just the biologically active and leave any adverse side effects behind. Earlier, I mentioned my focus was the suzuki smiar cross-coupling reaction. The reason why I focus on this one in particular is that it is one of the most widely used cross-coupling reactions. And just a little fun fact is that it shared the 2010 Nobel Prize in Chemistry with two other common cross-coupling reactions. And while it is very useful in synthesizing, it's very useful in synthesizing biologically active compounds and pharmaceutical drugs, and other life-changing drugs, suzuki miyara cross-coupling is important for the synthesis of non-edible compounds, such as herbicides and pesticides, to help our crops be more efficient and our gardens more beautiful, and polymers for OLEDs, or organic LEDs, and other value-added chemical, chemicals that are becoming more common in our electronics. While in the past, it might seem strange, or to us today, it might seem strange to search high and low for some magical flower with life-changing properties and perhaps making an old witch grumpy. This isn't too far from the reality of many years ago, minus, of course, the witch. And this is because what seems like magic a few hundred years ago is science today. And what we can only 
dream about today might actually be made a reality through chemistry in a few years. And thanks to the advancement of chemistry over the past several decades, instead of only dreaming about a compound or about a pharmaceutical drug, chemists can develop life-changing compounds in their lab given enough time. Just like assembling a Lego building or even a city through joining a series of blocks together, chemists can make many useful compounds from simple materials given enough time. As mentioned earlier, my research is focused on, further, on developing the suzuki miyara cross-coupling reaction. This is, there are two prongs of this. First, decreasing waste, and that would be targeting the electrophile and using electrophiles and components that don't have to be synthesized and also that can be obtained from a biomass so from plants in particular. Another way to de decrease waste would be to use less solvent in purification. The other prong would be decreasing cost, using more available reactants and therefore lower the cost. Another way would be to reduce the number of steps which would lead to less solvent being used and overall less difficulty, less time for the chemist. So to sum up my research itself, you could say I'm making this reaction work in ways that are previously unreported. And this will lead to the simpler synthesis or construction of complex and biologically relevant molecules. While it might seem like magic now, who knows what chemists will make possible in the future. If I were to sum up my talk, I would say a couple of things. First, cross-coupling is everywhere in our lives, from the toys we played with as children, to the medications we take every day, and even to the cell phones we look at a thousand times a day. And thankfully, we no longer rely on obtaining products from natural sources due to the advancements in chemistry, one of which is cross-coupling. And also, perhaps, is synthetic cross-coupling had existed during the time of Rapunzel, perhaps she would have never been kidnapped and kept in a lonely tower for so many years by Mother Gothel. Thank you. Thank you, John. Nice work. Mother Gothel! Um, does anyone have any questions for John about, um, uh, about, about chemistry or anything else, really? Aha, there's one already. Uh, this is from Charlie Clayton. Uh, what is the specific catalyst used in the reaction you study to reduce the activation energy? Or is there no catalyst required in your reaction? Unfortunately, the reaction I'm studying does require a catalyst. Uh, and particularly, I'm looking at a nickel catalyst. And part of the reason behind the nickel catalyst is that, in general, nickel is cheaper than other more historically used uh, transition metal catalysts or metals. Uh, also, it has this unique ability to react with difficult bonds to make them more in reach. So in a way to reduce the activation energy of the bond. And these compounds that have these difficult bonds are also from available from the lignin biomass and are widely more efficient and considered more green and more environmentally uh, responsible. Yeah, nice, John. Ah, here's another one. Uh, is there a specific product you are trying to develop? An antibiotic, an herbicide, a filter of some sort, perhaps a potion? But so be it I say. have thought of it. And there was something I created a couple of years ago where if I let it sit on a, in a glass container on a bench top, it would become a solid. And then as soon as I bumped it or tipped it over, it would turn back into a liquid. So I always thought that was kind of cool. But unfortunately, unfortunately, my focus is since I am more of just a synthetic chemist and uh, method chemist, I am looking for developing these ways where then other chemists, other, other more pharmaceutical or agroscience oriented chemists will use this chemistry for the synthesis of their compounds. 
John, you have caught our imagination. Uh, another question uh, from uh, Dean Ogilvy. What is the role of simulation slash large scale calculations in trying to guide your research? They play a very large role. Uh, the project I'm working on currently, we're using calculations or we're trying to marry up calculations with the experimental results, with the wet lab results to tell us why we are observing what we observe. Uh, also, we're trying to use calculations to inform us on what catalysts or what, what structures we should target that will actually make these reactions possible. And then there was, looks like there was a question just above Craig. Uh, do you make these compounds to target protein active sites? As of yet, no, uh, but I'm sure someone will adapt the chemistry I'm working on at some point to target active sites. Uh, John, for those of us who don't know, could you tell us a little bit about what protein active sites are? See if I remember enough of my biochemistry. <laughs> uh, if I'm recalling, they're basically the place in the protein where the protein, uh, where the protein exerts another change on a molecule, uh, and therefore targeting them could make them either be more efficient or shut them down, uh, if I'm recalling correctly. Does that, does that sound right, Muneeb? Who asked the question? Yay, victory for all. Excellent. Okay. Um, thank you, John. Nice work and great Q&A from everybody. Thanks for all these questions. This makes it a much more uh, dynamic process than you all just receiving information that we... Um... <laughs> <laughs> we all have to struggle with disappointment, I guess, Muni. Um, okay, so next, uh, our next speaker, uh, moving on, is Sobia Adjum. And Sobia is a PhD student working with Dr. Robin Gerlich in chemical and the in the chemical and biological engineering department. Take it away, Sobia. Thank you, Kent. So, hello everyone. Um, thank you for sticking with us for the past two days. Um, I am a part-time mom and a full-time PhD student. Let me tell you what that job looks like. So, about two years ago, um, my son turned one. We went for his regular pediatric exam. Um, and part of that exam included um, a blood test. Sorry, my screen. I am sorry, my screen just, okay. So a part of that exam, I, we went to a pediatrician, my son turned one, we went to his pediatrician, the part of the test included a blood test, which was for to test if he has high lead levels in his blood, or in other words, lead poisoning. Now, because I am an applied researcher, I had researched and decided to make food for him with fresh fruits, vegetables, no processed food, no salt, no sugar, everything that was recommended, I had made it mandatory in my home. So you can imagine my surprise when the doctor called me a few days later to let me know my son had high lead levels in his blood. I felt confused and honestly even a little bit guilty too. Um, and after the doctor calmed me down, she and, she and I went over a list of items in my household that could be sources of lead. She asked me if I have glazed ceramics, toys, china in my house. Do I have any imported cans of food? Everything she mentioned, I didn't have it at home. Until she said this, and this is weird, but she asked me if I have PVC blinds in my house. I did, and surprisingly or not so surprisingly, they were my son's favorite spot in the house. And that, that was a mystery solved for us because it turns out lead can actually deposit on blinds in our houses. And even though it has been banned in the United States for about 40 years and it cannot be used in any household products, it can still be present in old homes with old window blinds. 
And like any normal kid, my son loved licking stuff. For him, that stuff was those points. And when something like that happens, it makes you wonder what else deposits on surfaces in our homes. Um, for us, it was those tiny invisible lead particles in the air that deposited on those blinds over a time scale of decades. There is another chemical that likes to deposit on surfaces in our homes. These are compounds called volatile organic compounds, VOCs. They are gases. Um, and sometimes they just like to take a break and settle down on surfaces um, and just accumulate there over a period of time. But where do these VOCs come from in our homes? In our homes, at least, they come from glues. So thankfully, we are all safe because we don't use glues a lot. But wait, we have glues in our flooring, in our furniture, insulation around us, almost everything around us. And every time we do DIY projects, any repairs in the houses, these VOCs are off gas from these glues and accumulating their air and leading to a persistently higher amount of VOCs indoors than outdoors. But I still think we are safe because there are regulations in place to limit the amount of VOCs in these glues because we know at what concentration they are toxic for humans. They can cause organ damage or even cancer. But have we taken into account the VOCs that settle on surfaces? Not yet. A recent study showed that kids who are around surfaces with VOC deposits on them, they have altered skin microbiome, which is a layer of healthy bacteria on our skin. Uh, and we don't even understand what the implications of such altered microbiomes are yet. We have known for decades the synthetic glues contain VOCs. We know they are harmful for human and environmental health. Then why don't we just ban these VOC-based glues and use non-VOC glues? That is where the heart of the problem lies. We just don't have many strong non-VOC glue options available. And there is active research happening to find out more non-VOC glues, um, glue options. And one of those areas is to look for natural materials, which are renewable and do not contain VOCs. Um, and these glues, we call them green glues or green adhesives. Now, these green or natural options could look like pine sap from pine trees, soy protein from soybean plants, barnacles or mussels that attach on ship hulls, or sea cucumber, which produces the sticky spaghetti to trap animals, or bacterial cities that attach on rocks, produce a slimy layer, and trap all their food particles in that slime. If we can mass produce these options, then we can have a range of non-VOC glue options to work with. So in our lab, the material we picked from the nature's inventory were the slime cities. In natural habitats, bacteria love a community lifestyle. They love to attach to surfaces, build slime houses, slime malls, slime cities, so, uh, slime factories, slime skyscrapers, it's essentially a very textured community structure. Um, and one of these slime cities actually has a factory that can produce chalk particles, minerals, calcium carbonate. We call these factories biominerals, and they can also work as glues. It is strange to imagine glue with chalk particles in it. But here we are working with a world yet unknown to us. And because nature has been doing such a great job of using these as glues for multiple purposes, we decide to follow the blue blueprint. So we hijack these bacterial factories and we want to look at them. Now, if we want to talk about what scale these are formed at, so you can imagine a surface and a very one millimeter thick layer of these glues forming on it. So it's very small, so you have to go through the microscope and look at them. One of the nice things about this factory is it produces chalk particles that are fluorescent. So if you look through a microscope, shine UV light on these, the chalk lamps will glow. And you can look the bacteria downtown with all its neon signs. We, so that's how we look at it. But then we wonder, what does it feel like? Because it has two very different components. It has slime and it has chalk. What does it finally feel like when it dries off? And if it was big, chalk particle, I would probably tap on it and try to feel what it is like. But because we're working again with a very small scale, we come with a very small micro or um, micro scale tip 
and we tap on these particles. And that instrument collects the information about how hard this material is. And we use that information to build this clue. And to build this clue, we set three goals for it. We want it to be strong. We want to be able to reproduce it for quality control purposes. And we do not want it dissolving in water and disappear like salt. So to reach these three goals, we need to find out how much slime making chalk, how much slime making raw material should I provide and how much chalk making raw material should I provide and what combination of slime and chalk would work the best. We bring in the knocking information because if this material is not tough, it is not going to be able to hold itself. And then how do you consistently test a glue? We apply this glue between two surfaces. We clamp it, pull it apart. And when you do that, the instrument tells you how much force was needed to pull this material apart. The more force you need to pull it apart, the stronger the glue is. We know that this glue is stronger than most of the bio-based glues out there in the market right now. Um, and, and the results are reproducible. So we have taken care of our two goals. We have taken care of high strength and reproducibility, our quality control. Now, the third one is we do not want it dissolving in water and just disappearing. So what we do for that is, again, we apply it between two surfaces, put it in water, and we see if it just falls apart. So far, it looks like for 24 hours, it doesn't do that. So it can survive the water, and that's so it passes the water sensitivity test. We have taken care of the three goals I set for it. So we sit back and we look at the bigger picture. Is this glue the ultimate replacement for all the synthetic glues out there? No, probably not because it's still not as strong as the VOC glues out there. And it still has a long way, we still have a long way to making it the best glue option possible. What we have ultimately done is we have added one more option to the list of non-VOC glues. Every year, scientists are adding to that library of non-VOC glues. And the market for these green glues is gradually growing. There has been a significant rise in R&D spending, in companies to develop bio-based alternatives. And despite all challenges with higher production cost of bio-based glues, there is an increasing promise in the green adhesives market. We can quantify that by looking at the projected growth of bio-based adhesives market to a value of 2.5 billion US dollars, which is three times its value just a decade ago. What the bigger vision we scientists have is not only to have a mass awareness of the VOC problem, but to have a mass availability of the solution. And just like today, I have this option to make safe choices for my family and the environment in every aspect of my life. In a few years, I want my son to grow up and have this huge range of non-VOC glues in the market to pick from. That is what my research is focused towards. Thank you for sticking with me. <laughs> Thank you for sticking with us. Excellent. Uh, questions or uh, comments for Sophia, please. I have a, oh, go ahead, go ahead, hit it. I'm just wondering, besides glue, are there other things that biofilms can make? Probably. Yeah, there is the Center for Biofilm Engineering and Department, which has, I don't know how many labs, maybe more than 20, which work on all these different aspects of biofilms. Um, medical biofilms, environmental biofilms. My lab has been focused for the past 15, 20 years on just these biofilms that make chalk, and they use it to glue or cement soil particles where they need to be held together to go deep underground, hundreds of meters underground, where if you try to push cement in, um, it's very energy intensive, and sometimes it cannot go to very small cracks, but these tiny little bacteria can, and they can go and seal these fractures. So we have essentially been using it as a glue in a ton of options. <laughs> Finally, we are using it as a glue glue. <laughs> Uh, here's a question from Dean Olivier. Uh, 
Interesting to juxtapose Sobia's talk on bio-based production and John's talk on synthetic chemistry, or can you combine the best of both approaches? Yes, we can. Um, there are hybrid glues, which are natural, but also combined with processes like John mentioned, um, adding other chemical groups to these glues to make them less water sensitive, um, and just enhancing their strength by adding certain functional groups that um, um, that are th that can help them structurally as well as other challenges they would face environmentally. One of the like the top ones is water sensitivity, um, but there is a lot of work in that hybrid field as well. John chiming in also saying there has also been research into using enzymes to catalyze cross coupling reactions and wow. other reactions. And Oh, interesting. That's fascinating. It's cool. Yeah, it's neat to have it's neat to have you all in the same place. Um, and I think we have about 10 minutes left. Um, so what I'd like to do, if it's okay with the uh, with the audience, um, and, and if you have any other questions for, for Sobia, uh, please um, toss them into this kind of uh, um, free for all as well. I'd like to weave in um, Gazelle Vahidi, who is in the mechanical engineering department and also a Gallup Yin who is in the chemistry department as well um, to our panel. And I know that a lot of y'all in the audience are um, are here for various and sundry sort of connectors to um, uh, to STEM fields. And also uh, and also many of you are thinking about graduate school or also just kind of interested in science as a practice as opposed to as a specific professional discipline. So here is your opportunity to ask, um, and they're forced to answer you honestly because this is a professional function, uh, to ask some, uh, some, some graduate students some questions. Um, anybody have anything uh, about like a wide range, not just uh, what they're talking about today, but anything else that's uh, percolating in the back of your head, please have at it. And you can type in the chat as well if you don't feel comfortable unmuting yourself. Can I ask Sabia a question? This is Chelsea Heverin. Yes, Chelsea. Hi, Sabia. Great talk. Hey, so I was just so I love that so much. I've loved all these talks. And Sabia, I wanted I wanted to know your thoughts on. I mean, this this glue contains these living components, and what does it mean to have a living glue? Right, short term or potentially longer term. Um, a living glue would be something like people are trying to, or something like a living concrete that we talk about. If these bacteria can stay dormant or fall asleep, um, and then you give them nutrients again, they can regrow. Um, so, for example, you have a glue like this in a windowsill, and then there is a crack that forms, but it rains. So you again have water in there to for these bacteria to regrow and reform that surface and water drain water has enough carbonate actually um to be or, or even other ions to facilitate the formation of calcium carbonate the chalk in there so it can be a living glue it can be optimized to be a living glue <laughs> I have a question for Hannah. Um, thank you all. This was really fun. I loved hearing your stories. But uh, Hannah, I was wondering how your research um, ties into the idea of agriculture at, at adaptations to climate change. Yeah, that's a great question too. Um, Basically, what I know, I also study um, annual species in Yellowstone, so some native and some invasive. And what we know about these kind of plants is like usually more diversity and um, more variety in just plant types, whether that's root architecture or just different um, seasonality of plants is better for um, just their survival and their resilience to 
So I say it's loosely, I'm not directly studying how climate change affects agriculture, but we do think having some sort of diversity is kind of a buffer on your farm. So in terms of water or heat stress, a lot of the plants I find are doing a lot better than maybe just one monoculture of wheat, for example. So one of the things um, that has been part of, I guess, I mean, academic discourse for a really long time, uh, but certainly recently has become more in vogue is the idea of sort of interdisciplinary um, research, right? Uh, and so I was wondering if any of you have experiences where um, part of what you're working on right now uh, required you to inform yourselves or, um, cause you to sort of shift gears in what you're studying from something that was very, very specifically discipline focused into a kind of a wider um, uh, series of fields or something that was a little bit less um, just about something that would be classified as, a, as like chemistry or mechanical engineering. I know, Hazal, you're sort of, I mean, this question is maybe aimed a little bit at you, but, but also for anybody else who might want to answer it. Yeah, I definitely can chime in on that. Like coming from a really mechanical engineering heavy background, I did my master's in mechanical engineering plus my bachelor's. And then I started to do my PhD in mechanical engineering, but I decided to work on something really different, which had a really heavy biological side to it. And um, yeah, my advisor, Chelsea, is also here to come out for that. It wasn't an easy start, honestly. Like I had to spend a lot of time educating myself to even understand the words that people were using in their papers because I was so outside of this discipline. But then like it was, it had like a six month um, hard like peak period. But then I eventually felt like, yeah, this is where I'm supposed to be. I was enjoying what I was doing and I still I'm doing like, I'm using a lot of my mechanical engineering knowledge. We are doing a lot of mechanical testings and a lot of calculations that requires that mechanical background, but it's super cool to like tie it with, um, biological stuff and try to use those mechanical tools to answer some biological questions. So, yeah. And, um, Engineering should be like something scary <laughs> for, uh, yeah, like even like doing um, graduate school in that because you always have a lot of opportunities. Like in mechanical engineering, you can be basically working on anything <laughs> that you can imagine and still be entitled as mechanical engineering. So, yeah, it's super cool. <laughs> um, I I'm in the same boat as Ghazal. I was a microbiologist um, who came to the engineering department um, and I hadn't done math for like seven, eight years <laughs> before I got here. <laughs> and again, like I could not understand what people were saying. It almost sounds gibberish in the beginning. Um, and right now, the only thing that is microbiology in my project is that I'm using bacteria. Everything else is, I don't know, chemical engineering, mechanical engineering. Um, and I'm glad that that is where we are headed and there is a lot of collaboration because there is so much more potential. Like the Dean asked was like, can you combine John and Sylvia's project? We probably can. And that's amazing what new functionalities we can discover with this overlap that we do. And I think that's interesting too, when we talk about, when you're talking about overlapping this, this other question, uh, 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 from Craig is, uh, is is fascinating as well. The image of a scientist is often as a solo person, right? Mad scientist, lab, down underground, Tesla coils in the background, but like alone. Um, what has been your experience with collaborations and team projects in science? I guess I have, um, I had a great experience my first year of my PhD. I'm strictly in ecology, but I got into part of a working group, which was a bunch of graduate students and professors and extension people from geography. So like there were social scientists, there were hydrologists, there were ecologists, and we all 
wrote a paper together about the Northern Great Plains and about the social ecological conflicts that are happening there. And it was really interesting how we all saw one landscape and one system from so many different views and we got to publish on it. And it was really, I learned a lot. <laughs> it's definitely one of the things that keep things basically spicy. I've been working on crazy stuff like on insect. Like I was doing like some nano indentation on insect wings <laughs> at the beginning of my career, which was super weird, but super cool. You get to like know different stuff from all over the place, which one of the things I love about collaboration in this university, I think it gives you a lot of opportunity to not only know stuff, but also like you may understand you're like more interested in some other part of the science that you weren't even ever of them. So, yeah, I think it's pretty important to get involved in this kind of teamwork and collaborations. I, let's see, my experience. Well, for me, it's been more just like in, in my own group or in my lab group, which is fluctuated from like four to like 10 other people in the group over the years I've been here. And it's really important who your group is and like that you get along with the members in your group because they will ultimately be working with you on projects, be helping you learn different techniques. And it's, there are so many different ways that it could be terrible to be working on a project. If they wanted to, my, the group members could be really mean and sabotage everything, but fortunately they're great. And like my experience is that like, make sure you know that you can work with the people you're going to work with. Make sure you know who they are. But yeah, it's very good. And it's, it's an important part of science and chemistry. And like, no, no scientist is able to do it all. I think that's a great sort of winding up statement, John. Thank you so much. And yes, for all of you who are like, Ugh, I can't believe I have another group project. Believe us all when we say that collaboration and working with other human beings is the only way that really uh, that strong work gets done. And it's such a skill to cultivate. Um, even at, and and it's even more rewarding when you get to choose the people that you, <laughs> that you get to work with and you're not assigned them. Um, thank you all so much for coming today. We really deeply appreciate that we've been working on these talks for so long. It's so it's not useful if you can't share them with people. So um, thank you all for coming out. It's really it's really exciting. Um, and one more round of applause for all of our presenters. And I'll turn it back to Maeve, if you have anything else you'd like to say. Thank you. Thank you all so much for presenting to us today. We appreciate it. Uh, the attendance link is in the chat. I'll hang around for a few minutes and uh, that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you so much for coming. Bye everyone. Thank you.